Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott and I'm here again in yet another snowstorm. Seems to be a kind of a common theme here in uh, Canada in winter. But I'm here to talk to you about the new EFM version of the Viltrox 23mm, 33mm and 56mm f1.4 autofocusing lenses. So previously, I have looked at each of those lenses in a for a different system. Uh, some of them I looked at for Fuji X mount. I looked at at least one of them for Sony E mount. But now uh, Viltrox has released them in the Canon EF EFM mount, which is really welcome con considering how few uh, prime options we have had, particularly with wide aperture, on some of Canon's EFM bodies. Now I've used the EOS M5 uh, for this review. And, and today I've actually only been able to look at the 33 millimeter and 56 millimeter as I didn't get a 23 millimeter copy in hand. If you're interested, however, in the unique kind of optical performance of each lens, you can look back at my 23 millimeter, which, which I did on Sony, which, which will give you a pretty good idea of the optical performance. With each system, of course, you get a few quirks when it comes to their unique focusing system and way of doing things. But fortunately, I've found a pretty consistent performance across the various uh, lenses that I've taken a look at. Now, there are some limitations to you know, each one of these different cameras in terms of their focus quality. But fortunately, I've found that um, overall, my experience has been quite good. And IAF on the M5 is not as sophisticated as it would later become on some of the newer bodies. But at the same time, for portrait work, I actually had really good focus results, even in backlit situations. Canon has a slightly different crop factor than either Sony or Fuji. You do have slightly different focal lengths here. And so um, on the 23 millimeter, you end up with a 37 millimeter equivalent. So almost 35 millimeter with the 33 millimeter you end up with a 53 millimeter full frame equivalent so near 50 millimeters and the 56 millimeter becomes 90 millimeters with Canon's crop factor and so again almost 85 millimeters but a little bit longer because of the unique crop factor obviously we're still looking at basically the 35 millimeter 50 millimeter and 85 millimeter roughly angles of view which of course those are the most common primes and most highly valued and in each case you're getting a large f1.4 aperture so let's take a look hands-on to see what you're getting in the build and the handling of these little lenses let's take a look so as we take a closer look at the build and design of these, the first thing that stands out is, of course, the fact of the silver finish, which compared to the, you know, older, which is a relative term since all of these are new lenses, but the XF and then the E-mount versions came first. But what we see is that obviously you have a less traditional looking and a little bit more flashy. So that's either going to be a good or a bad thing, depending upon your personal taste. But what we continue to have is really nicely made lenses here. There is actually a brass lens mount, which, you know, is a pretty high grade material for such an inexpensive lens. They continue to have the ability to easily update firmware once you figure out how to do it right on the lens itself, which I think is a great feature. I wish that was a universal feature. To me, it just seems like the, the easiest and most logical way to update firmware. And so anyway, kudos to them on that. Still no weather sealing gaskets there. I would like to see that as the next thing that they tackle in lens design. We continue to have the dual purpose aperture. And so it's a declicked aperture. Um, you don't necessarily feel any detents there except for the space between F16 and going to the automatic mode. But what you can do is you can, you know, you do have markings at one third stop detents. And so you have really good spacing on the aperture ring. And so it's not hard to, you know, to find the aperture value that you want. And I do find that I've gotten consistent aperture results when I'm doing my test, like I actually get the aperture that I want. So they're fairly accurate. Likewise, we have got a fairly nicely damped, um, you know, it's, it's a lightweight kind of metal alloy, as is the build, but manual focus ring that does the job fairly well. And then the lens hood itself is also metal in all these cases. And so with a nice machined ribbing inside, and, and so it, it feels quite premium, which, you know, everything about the build feels quite premium considering the price point. Up front, we have a 52 millimeter front filter thread on the 33 millimeter lens. And we also find the same on the 56 millimeter. They're 
both have STM motors inside. And so in terms of the overall, the overall dimensions are near identical. The uh, 56 millimeter is ever so slightly heavier. It weighs in at 290 grams versus 270 grams for the 33 millimeter. And our outer dimensions on both lenses is, is the same. It's 65 millimeters in terms of diameter and the overall length is 72 millimeters. So nice and compact, obviously, particularly when you're considering you're getting a nice big maximum aperture of f1.4. Also similar is that in both cases, you get a 1.0 times magnification, which is not all that impressive. And, uh, but your minimum focus distance is going to change a little bit, you know, because of the focal length itself. In the 33 millimeter, it's 40 centimeters. On the 56 millimeter, it's 60 centimeters. So all told, relative to you know competing lenses, I think that you're actually getting a really nice degree of build. And the only thing that I could really criticize or you know point as lacking is there's no AF MF switch and no weather sealing on it. Other than that, however, you're getting quite a highly featured and a very nicely made lens for a relatively small amount of money. So as you can see, it's really hard to complain about too much there because for the price point, I mean, with the 33 millimeter, you're talking about a lens that retails for only $239. I believe that to the uh, the 23 millimeter is somewhere around $260 or $70, and then close to $300 for the 56 millimeter. But in none of these cases are you talking about big money. And so this is actually a really strong build that I would say is arguably as good or better as anything you're going to get in this class. And at a lower price point than any of the competing lenses. So as noted, each one of these lenses comes with a STM or stepping motor. And I will give Viltox credit because as we noted in the handling section, it's pretty easy to apply firmware updates. And they've also been nice and persistent in continuing to improve autofocus via firmware update. So the, the byproduct is that by the time you get to this most recent mount, you know, they've had a chance to really tweak algorithms. And I would say that you've got a fairly competent lens here. IAF worked well. Um, as I noted, this isn't the most sophisticated IAF focusing camera, but I found that the results were good for it. And in other situations, I found focus to be uh, very good as well. And, and so again, you have to kind of you know, deal within the quirks of each autofocusing system. But I, I would say that the lenses themselves seem to be doing an able job. Let's take a look at both of them in turn. First of all, we'll take a look at the 33 millimeter and how it performs for uh, focus pulls and the amount of sound that you hear in focus. Let's take a look. So as you can see, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty good there. Um, it's doing a, a decent job, and um, I think that our focus pulls are pretty decent. As you can see, video quality drops because we're limited to 1080 on the M5, and it's not the world's best 1080 at that. So let's take a look at the 56 millimeter now. So again, uh, you know, roughly similar performance, but I think that th these are within the wheelhouse of what you would, you know, expect from uh, lenses like this. And overall, my autofocus consistency was was good during my uh, testing period, and so I, I don't really have anything particularly negative to say about autofocus over the course of the review period. So we're gonna jump in and let's take a look at what you're getting in terms of image quality from each one of these lenses. We'll do a kind of a mini review of each of them in terms of the image quality. Let's take a look. Let's start off by taking a look at our vignette and distortion here on, we're gonna look at the 33 millimeter first and then we'll uh, move over to the 56 millimeter. So as you can see wide open, there is a tiny bit of pincushion distortion on the 33 millimeter and uh, it's reasonably linear. You can see that I was able to correct it, you know, reasonably well, not quite perfectly, but not too bad overall. I used a minus three to a value to correct for that. And then as far as the vignette goes, vignette fairly heavy here. And so you can see that I used a plus 75, which is pushing us close to three stops into those corners, slid the midpoint over, a fairly even correction. But as I see sometimes in uh, lenses, you know, with, when you have a perfectly even background, you end up with a little bit of a discoloration um, when you correct. It's almost as if there is a little bit of color shift in those corners. 
numbers. And so you can see that most situations you won't see it. However, you know, you will, and again, with a, a uniform background, you might see that when you correct the vignette. So how about our sharpness? This is on a 24 megapixel uh, Canon EOS M5. So if we zoom into the middle, we can see that there is a fairly decent amount of resolution there. Contrast, not too, too bad, but neither is it kind of popping off the page. Mid-frame looks, you know, fairly good. Good detail that is there and uh, contrast, not too bad. And uh, looking down here, I mean, at, this is at 200%. So things are looking really pretty good. And looking down into the extreme corner, it also looks pretty good. So a pretty decent amount of uh, sharpness across the frame. We can see looking down into this corner there is just a tiny bit of lateral chromatic aberrations and so nothing that's going to you know impact image sharpness too much so again a pretty good um, pretty good handling of that I would say. Stopping down to f2 gives us uh, an obvious increase in our contrast above all else. There's a little bit more resolution but you can see above all it's contrast that is improving and thus you know text is becoming more legible. Uh, moving to the mid frame at f2 this looks fairly crisp and so a nice result there and down into the corner we can see that contrast has improved and really we can see that we've got usable resolution right off towards the very corner stopping down to f2.8 gives us just a little bit more contrast but you know it's not all that noticeable Stopping on down to f4 definitely helps to boost contrast a little bit higher and you can see that the lens is getting really nice and sharp at this point. Finally at f5.6 you can see that the corners are really crisp at this point which is going to allow the lens to actually perform fairly well for landscape situations. Here's a case in point at f5.6, I'll go full frame here. And uh, you can see that the detail across the frame is really, really nice. Um, you can just see that, you know, there's a lot of crisp details. And right off at the edge of the frame, uh, you can see that there is good information everywhere we look here. So a nice result there for landscapes when stopped down. So our maximum magnification is not all that high. It's only 0 0.10 times. But what we can see as we zoom in that even wide open, we've got fairly good resolution and contrast and stopping down to F2 on the right increases that even further. And so you can get a reasonably good result at minimum focus, even if the magnification percentage isn't all that high. We can also see at f1.4 there is a bit of longitudinal chromatic aberration. You can see some uh, purple and then some green fringing after the plane of focus. Uh, stopping down to f2 does um, obviously uh, it eliminates a lot of that which is why you can see the contrast is better and we saw that for example just in that close up that contrast was superior. Now you can get a bit of a generalized kind of veiling if the sun is in the frame. You can see it's not, isn't like destructive in terms of the ghosting in this backlit image, but we can also see that, um, you know, our resolution and contrast is held up nicely. Everything looks uh, good on the subject and the uh, background looks pretty nice as well. Another uh, portrait from that setting and so you can see that you know again the rendering on the skin everything looks quite nice and the image as a whole looks good and so this is certainly a viable portrait lens. Uh, I also found again the close-up situation that I'm happy with the detail and contrast and the background blur is actually quite nice. One final portrait to look at and so you can see here that again our detail a contrast looks nice. A little bit of busyness in some of these areas, but you know, when you consider the price of the lens, this is a, a pretty nice budget portrait option. So looking at the 56 millimeter, we can see that there is a very, very mild degree of pincushion distortion. Probably in most situations, you wouldn't have to worry about correcting that. It corrects fairly well. Like we saw on the 33 millimeter, the vignette is fairly concentrated in the corners, which is a little bit problematic because you do end up with that correction hue bias that I alluded to earlier if you have a uniform background. I corrected distortion with a minus two, so one less than the 33 millimeter and also less vignette correction needed as well. It's a plus 44 with the midpoint slid over. As you can see, illumination is fairly even, but there is that kind of discoloration that resulted from the correcting. 
So looking at sharpness, we can see again, there is a pretty good amount of resolution that's there in the center of the frame. What we do see though is that, you know, contrast is a little bit lower, same kind of pattern with a little bit of aberrations that are uncorrected. Uh, we can see here though, that stopping down to F2 really adds a lot of contrast into the equation. Looking at the mid frame, again, resolution is pretty good wide open. Stopping down to F2 increases that contrast if that's your desired outcome. Now down into the corner, we don't see as good of acuity into the corners on the 56 millimeter as we did with the uh, the 33 millimeter. And so if, you know, corner to corner sharpness is your priority, the Sigma 56 millimeter F1.4 might be a better option, though it is going to cost you a bit more money. Uh, we can also see, looking over here, that um, there is a little bit of lateral chromatic aberrations that show up there, but again, not extreme enough to where they're going to make much of an impact to your image. And we can see there's not really a whole lot of bleeding, um, and everything looks pretty pretty crisp in the, uh, the moving from black to white uh, there in those lines. Stopping down to f2.8 gives us a very sharp center result, um, a very sharp uh, mid-frame result, and in the corners, we can see that that is remaining soft. Let's take a look at the other corner to see if it's any better. And you can see it's really not. And so we're just not getting amazing uh, corner sharpness um, relative to the performance throughout most of the frame. Stopping down to F4 gives us a pretty significant corner improvement. As you can see, it just looks a lot better. And stopping on down to f5.6, it looks better still. And so the good news is, is that if you want to shoot something like a landscape, you can get a good result just by shooting at a more typical uh, landscape aperture. Going to a 100% magnification for a kind of a real world image here, you can see at f1.4, center of the frame looks pretty decent, but obviously it improves, stop down to f2.8 in terms of contrast and the acuity in these uh, needles. If we move off towards the edge of the frame, we can see that that difference is even more substantial and obviously we get a lot sharper. What we can also see is that f1.4, there is a lot of longitudinal chromatic aberration that you can see here that clears up as you stop down to f2.8. And so particularly if you've got high contrast snow, uh, f1.4 at a landscape distance is not going to be your friend. That really stood out to me in this particular shot where, um, as you can see, shooting near infinity at f1.4, you know, detail actually looks fairly decent on the plane of focus, but the uh, longitudinal chromatic aberration is pretty brutal in this setting with that purple fringing just really, really pronounced. You can see that again on my chart, f1.4, you can see that fringing is, is pretty strong and stopping down even to f2 does a, a lot of correcting for that and obviously hugely improves the contrast as well. So uh, just, you know, something to bear in mind depending on what you're shooting. So our minimum focus distance here is 60 centimeters and again, it's only a 0 0.10 times magnification. But again, I do give them pretty good marks because as you can see, contrast actually looks quite good even at f1.4 in this setting. And I also note that it's a fairly flat plane of focus, which enables you to get at f2 quite a spectacular uh, close-up you know, performance here. Look how great the, and how crisp the, uh, the text is there. And so anyway, um, you know, kind of a mixed bag in terms of performance, but I will say that, you know, as far as contrast and resolution close up, it's, it's really quite good. This is the lens that's actually capable of producing quite a bit of blur, as you can see from this image. And as you start to get towards that defocus, it, I think, looks quite good here. Here's another shot where I'm a little bit further away from the subject, but once again, a fairly good delineation. Um, you know, you can see that there could be a little bit more contrast, but really looked at globally, it looks quite good. And again, the bokeh looks fairly nice. Another shot here at f1.4. And again, I think that that's actually fairly good sharpness and a nice bleed away that takes place. Let's end off with a couple of portraits here. So here's an f1.4. And so you can see it looks uh, fairly good. Uh, you know, again, contrast could be a little bit better, but we got good IAF detection during this segment. The image overall looks fine. And then here at f2, uh, we can see that obviously, as we've seen as the pattern, there's a lot more contrast available. And I think that the, uh, the bokeh here still looks pretty decent beyond. So overall, I mean, while there is a little more uh, aberration 
limitations and what I would like to see. The trade-off for that is that the background blur looks pretty decent here. And so again, it's a, another nice budget portrait lens. So at the end of the day, I think that we have got a good very nice lenses here really for the amount of money and certainly a welcome addition. I would say that the chief competition for these lenses is probably going to be at least at the 56 millimeter. Uh, if you're looking for a lens that, that is arguably even sharper and um, even higher performing, the Sigma 56 millimeter f1.4 is available for EFM. It's a pretty fantastic lens. However, it is running you a couple of hundred dollars more in terms of the price point. And so, um, but that's probably cheap competition. And likewise, I would say the, uh, the Sigma 30, 30 millimeter f1.4, not an identical focal length, but you know, close enough. But at the same time, I do note that the Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4, it's a little bit harder to sell because it's not as good optically and it's an older lens relative to the newer 56 millimeter. And so uh, it does have quite a bit more barrel distortion, for example, than what the uh, 33 millimeter Viltrox does. And then you don't really have a direct competitor for the 23 millimeter. And so I think that it's, you know, outside of maybe Canon's own EFM 22 millimeter F2, but you're dealing with a, a different lens for sure, um, with different kinds of, of strengths and weaknesses. So overall, I think these are really welcome additions to uh, Canon's EFM system. And so if you're looking for inexpensive, large aperture primes that actually do quite a good job, then take a look at the Viltrox options. I'll throw a linkage in the description down below if you want to research a little bit more. I also have image galleries if you want to check those out and they'll be linked to as well. Beyond that, of course, linkage to follow me on social media, uh, assuming that I don't freeze to death out here. And uh, beyond that, you can uh, become a patron. You can sign up for my newsletter that comes out every Thursday. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button, ring that bell so you get notifications of new content. And have a great day and let the light in.